Hello and welcome back to 10 American aircraft I want to see in War Thunder. Today we will take a look at the top 5 spots and we will start right away with the Ward F7U3M Catalyst. The Catalyst is a 1950s carrier borne jet fighter designed by Ward, which had had previous experience with carrier fighters in the form of the F4U Corsa. Now, Ward managed to take advantage of German research that became available after Germany's defeat. Um, in 1945 and the subsequent aircraft would be a beautiful well advanced design um, with hydraulic po hydraulically power controls uh, for 20 mm 20 m3 cannon and would be the first navy aircraft with a swept back wing the aircraft was also fitted with a long stocky nose landing gear which gave the aircraft a high angle of attack when sitting on the carrier flight deck making it ideal for uh, carrier operations as Navy aircraft, it would also be equipped with foldable wings. Taken to the sky for the first time on the 29th of September 1948, the first production version would be the F7U1. This was fitted with the Westinghouse J34, a terrible engine. Um, this engine was basically obsolete on, arri on arrival, had terrible reliability and made the, uh, the Cutlass severely underpowered. Uh, and this is basically the version that gave the type its bad reputation. This was to be followed by the F-72 equipped with the Allison J-35 engine, however none of these would be built. Which means that the next version, the F-73, became the main production version. Much improved now, it was fitted with two, gel, uh, with two J-46 engines with an afterburner that cured a lot of the engine problems. Um, the Dash 3M also equipped uh, with, were equipped with uh, first generation Sparrow missiles. These were beam riding so they would make quite, unique, quite a unique experience in War Thunder. The Dash 3 could not solve all the problems however. Um, the Cutlass would remain a maintenance hawk. It had problems with the landing gear and the engine still did not live up, did not live up to their full expectation. It did subsequently have a very short service life. Introduced in 1951, it only served until 1959 before being replaced largely by the F-8 Crusader. Its high accident rate gave the Cutlass a very bad reputation, a quarter of all were apparently lost. However, that might not be fair to the aircraft. Remember that this machine was highly advanced for the time um, and there were lots of new ground to cover with lots of obstacles of course in the way with an aircraft as advanced as it was. The hydraulics for example ran at twice the PSI of other aircraft of that time, but were still equipped with standard fittings which resulted in the uh, hydraulic system constantly leaking. While the aircraft was a maintenance hawk, it was apparently a dream to fly in the sky with an insanely high roll rate and its 245kg wing loading also making it very maneuverable. It also was a very stable gunnery platform. Top speed was 1122 km per hour, which is certainly not bad for the day. Today several of the cutlasses survive in various museums and incredibly one is apparently restored to flying condition by an aircraft enthusiast who has worked over 40 years now collecting parts and building a Corsa, a, Corsa, a cutlass so that it finally can take to the sky where it belongs. In the game, I would say the Cutlass should be a 9.0 BR event vehicle. We have several of these Navy um, jets as event vehicles in the game, like the F11, F1F, uh, F11F, F11F, and the um, A4D Skyray, and the Cutlass would fit right into that as well. At the number 4 spot, we come to the XP72. Nicknamed the Ultra or Superbolt, the XP-72 was a further development of Republic's successful P-47 Thunderbolt. The main change from the P-47 was the replacement of the R-2800 Double Wasp with the massive Pratt & Whitney R-4360 Wasp Major of some 3450 horsepower, giving the XP-72 a massive gain in engine horsepower. Envisioned as an interceptor, two prototypes of the XP-72 were ordered in 1943. Taken to the sky for the first time on the 2nd of February 1944, the first prototype was fitted with a standard four-bladed propeller. Modifications and testing were surprisingly straightforward, with the P-47's fuselage responding quite well to the new engine and inherent modifications. 
Flight testing would reveal speeds of 490 miles per hour, that's 789 kilometers per hour, making the XP-72 one of the fastest prop-driven fighters ever built. The second prototype would be fitted with a contra-rotating propeller. Armament was somewhat reduced from 8 to 650 caliber machine guns, although proposals were also made to equip the XP-72 with four 37mm cannons. By 1944, um, however, the need for interceptors was not really there. Uh, focus had shifted more to long-range escorts fighter, and uh, in general, it was seen that um, turbojet-powered aircraft would be the future. Therefore, the XP-72 was subsequently cancelled. In the game, the XP-72 will be probably the king of super props. This will be a very high tier prop aircraft with a battle rating of at least 6.3, possibly 6.7. Um, it has a wing loading of 235 kg per square meter and a 7.9 ton uh, loaded weight, so it won't be that much of a good uh, turner, particularly at low speed. However, with the P-47s already being very good high speed performers, the XP-72 will certainly improve on that, um, making it an incredibly good boom and zoomer um, and with the um, increased climb rate of some 26 meters per second initially, this will also be uh, a good energy fighter. Since there were two different prototypes and there are also two different armament proposals, I could see one of them being an irregular tech tree after the uh, P-47s and one maybe as a premium. At the number 3 spot sits the Ryan FR1 Fireball. This is really one of the most unusual planes of its time. And the FR1 was a mixed powered fighter built and ordered during World War II. It is one of the most obscure World War II aircraft to have actually been built and deployed, although it did not see combat. The FR1 was powered by an R1820 Cyclone, augmented by a J31 of some 7 kN of thrust. It was designed in 1943 and had this unusual power setup because early jet engines reacted poorly to throttle input particularly at low speed and had rather low thrust at low speed making them unsuitable for carrier operations. With the radial engine fitted in conjunction with the jet this could be somewhat mitigated with the radi radial engine being used for cruising and to land the aircraft while the jet engine could be engaged during combat. The aircraft was otherwise rather conventional with a tricycle landing gear and 450 caliber machine guns. A bubble canopy also offered excellent visibility. First flight took place on the 25th of June 1944, with the aircraft having a particularly unlucky testing phase, with three prototypes being lost. After modifications, contracts for 700 aircraft were made, however with the war coming to an end, only 66 had been built, forming one squadron VF-66 before further production was cancelled. The fireballs uh, subsequently never saw combat, however they were used heavily to qualify new pilots and for evaluating aircraft with jet engines for use upon carriers. Problems were noted with the nose landing gear um, because previous fighter aircraft in the Navy were of tail dragger design and the tricycle landing gear was quite a novelty in this department. Um, and in general, the novelty of the aircraft led to a number of accidents, with the aircraft also showing signs of fatigue and structural weakness, they were deemed unsuitable for carry operations in 1947, um, were subsequently retired, with all but one being scrapped. Several proposals for different engine configurations were also made, but with the advent of full jet-powered aircraft in Navy service, these plans were cancelled. All in all, 71 were built in total, with only one surviving to this day. Now it's difficult to determine where the fireball will sit in the tech tree. It will certainly offer a unique experience with, with its mixed powered propulsion and I would like to see this in the uh, regular tech tree rather than as a premium. Um, and with only 450 cals it will be a lightly armed aircraft so I won't see very high in the tech tree. Its top speed despite having a jet engine is only 686 km per hour and with a 4.8 ton weight thanks to its two engines it probably won't be that uh, much of an agile aircraft. I would see it at 4.3, 4.7 maybe at first and then adjust the BR according to its performance. 
And we now come to the number two spot and here we find none other than the F11 F1F Super Tiger. This was a further development of the F11 F Tiger which is one of my favorite aircraft of the 1950s and by the way I do have a guide of this aircraft available here on my channel. One of the Tiger's disadvantages was um, an inherent lack of engine power which is why the Wright J65 was replaced by the General Electric J79, the same engine that would power the F4 Phantom. This necessitated uh, differently shaped air inlets, but otherwise the switch to the new engine was comparatively uncomplicated. A longer nose was fitted, making room for uh, an all-weather radar, something the F11 lacked. However, I am not sure if it was ever installed in the prototypes. Um, the new F11 F1F first flew in May 1956, the same year the regular F-11 was introduced into service. Tests proved very successful and after the fitting of an uprated J-79, the Super Tiger completely smashed all expectations, reaching Mark 2.04, the first Navy aircraft to do so in 1957. The aircraft would also set a new altitude to world record. It would overall be um, a stunning performer. Uh, with great movability, great acceleration, good climb rate, and would also be armed with four 20mm cold Mark 12 cannon and tested with various armaments including sidewinders, ball pups, and the notoriously unreliable uh, Falcon missile. Um, this would have made the aircraft not only well armed for the air to air but also the air to ground role. Despite all that, the Navy had set their eyes already on the upcoming F 8 Crusader. And while the US Air Force also showed interest, nothing would come of that as well, since they focused on the F-104 Starfighter. Therefore, Grumman tried selling the aircraft to foreign customers, with a number of countries showing interest, including um, Japan and my home country, Germany. However, the fact that the aircraft was only available in prototype form and the lack of marketing management would hamper upcoming sales. More importantly, Lockheed, who offered their Starfighter on the export market as well, were not better in uh, in marketing management, but also bribed several high officials in some of the expected customer countries, leading to a lot of them choosing the Starfighter. The Starfighter would sub subsequently cause lots of headaches because while it was a great interceptor, it failed of doing really anything else and could be dangerous to fly, particularly to novice pilots. Um, the Super Tiger with its multi role capabilities and good flying characteristics would have been the far better choice, particularly for Germany, which tried using the Starfighters as low level fighter bombers, paying with a high number of accidents and, fat and fatalities. So much so that the F 104 in Germany is to this day known as the Wittenmacher Widowmaker or the Erdnagel, which means Earth Nail. <laughs> Subsequently, the Super Tiger achieved no sales and only the two prototypes would be built. One of these survives today. With the Super Tiger's great performance and various missile elements, I would see this as a great 9.7 aircraft for the US tech tree. Um, depending on the variants of AIM-9s this, this was tested with, I suspect only the AIM-9Bs, I don't think it was tested with AIM-9Ts. Um, but yeah, depending on what armament it would, would receive, judging if it, if it only gets the aim and bees um and the bulb hops and maybe even the falcons i would see it as a bad rating of 9.0 it doesn't have any flares so this would be the perfect br for this machine before we come to the number one spot here are some honorable mentions first of all the fisher p75 eagle which was to be a high performance single engine fighter then we have the Kaiser Fleetwings XPTK, which was a torpedo slash dive bomber that competed with the Douglas Sky Raider. Then we come to the utterly ridiculous XF 84H Thunder Screech, the loudest aircraft ever. And then the XF 5U, which I had in the title card, but I've, the problem is this thing never took to the sky. And it is such an unusual aircraft that uh, it would be difficult to get into a, into the game because there are no real flight data available for it and at the number one spot we find the Convair XP81 this is another mixed powered aircraft intended to be used as a next generation escort fighter accompanying B-29s the XP81 was already developed during World War II um, for optimal performance a TG100 turboprop was considered for cruising 
with a J43 jet engine as a backup and to boost performance during combat. The contract for two prototypes was awarded in January 1944, which was later expanded to 13 YP-81 pre-production aircraft. The production of the prototypes was hampered by a lack of return probe engine, which went into delays, hence a Packard V1650 was used on the first prototype as an interim solution. In this configuration it first took to the sky on February 7th of 1945. Several subsequent tests flights proved successful and the aircraft was refitted with a TG-100 turboprop once it became available. Tests with the new engine showed flaws in the turboprop as it was a new engine and needed further work to iron out teething problems. Moreover, the testing showed the turboprop not living up to its expectations, only achieving around the same output as the, as the uh, V1650 instead of the 2300 horsepower advertised. This led to the initial expected 769 kilometers on the deck uh, being not achievable and it only managed 643, which however is still quite fast. Otherwise, the aircraft displayed great handling uh, with good climb and light controls. Proposals to re-equip the aircraft with better versions of their respective engines were turned down and the Air Force lost interest subsequently. The ad advent of capable uh, full power jet aircraft made the X-81 obsolete in their eyes, despite the promising design. Since the war was also long over, the need for an escort fighter was not really given and the aircraft was, would be cancelled. Both prototypes would survive, although in bad condition, and they still await restoration to the former glory. The XP-81 was actually the first turboprop-powered aircraft of the US that took to the sky. Now this will be quite an interesting machine um, in the game. It is, will be very fast. It does have a high wing loading of 283 kilograms, but uh, internet armament was either 650 cals or 620 mm cannons. And from that alone, this thing will be would be quite fun to fly with its powerful engines. Depending on if they give the TG-100 its full power output. I would think it would sit at VR of 6.3 to 6.7 and this would be, I think this would be so much fun to fly. I would really love it, more mainly because this is also just such a good looking aircraft. I mean, just, ah, uh, it looks so well balanced. I absolutely love the looks of the XP-81. But yes, that's it for this video. I hope you liked it, hope you agree with my choices. And I will see you in the next one.